put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. Untitled Hitman sequel. No, wait. The Punisher 2004. No. The Transporter refueled. Mood review. The Transporter, Frank Martin, the rule driven former military without necessarily getting into details, driver for hire parks his car and engages in a series of elaborate heists with four sex workers, prostitutes. And yeah, the there's not a lot of driving in this. And of course, these heists get the attention of the bad guys and there is a kidnapping of Frank's father which is not the first time Ray Stevenson has been involved with the kidnapping of a loved one to coerce someone to into working with someone they'd rather not or the first time he's been involved in a someone taking down a Russian human trafficking mafia yeah, he, yeah, one of, one of the bad guys, kind of the main bad guy, is Bugs Bunny from A Good Day to Die Hard. And I chose not to hold that role against him. However, he really does not get to do a lot in this. It, it, the guy is genuinely sinister and, you know threatening you you get the sense that this guy would just you know but he he gets to do almost nothing and it's really you know as as the film reached its climax i realized he's had hardly any screen time and most of the screen time he is just trying to figure out what the prostitutes are doing you know figure out who they are and what exactly, how they're doing what they're doing, and and this sort of, and it's fine to have kind of the good guys be, you know, really, really take charge of the situation, but you gotta have a villain that has some, some teeth to him, and in this case, he just, yeah, it's... just rather unimpressive it's yeah it's it's not entirely unclear that this is some of the same people who made Taken 3 now with the involvement of Frank's father they they call they refer to each other or Frank's father calls him junior and that's nice. It's it's Dad and Junior, so that's yeah. And he is apparently they apparently do are both named Frank, or maybe I got that wrong, but it it seemed like. But yeah, this time it's personal and other cliches. Starting with last minute notes to get into why I call it Hitman and the Punisher 2004 the four prostitutes take down this you know Russian mafia kingpin by taking gradually taking out the people he works with and working their way up to dealing with him so it yeah, it straight up is just like in The Punisher. If you, you know, just trade out, you know, that Frank with four prostitutes. And, yeah, I mean, I love Hitman Agent 47. 
and I maintain that that is a great Hitman film, but it does, you know, where, where the 2007 film really had him killing several targets, you know, the, the, yeah, the new one, it's mostly faceless goons. This one, yeah, kind of, it's, it's, again, swap out, you know, 47 for the, these four prostitutes, and it's about, it, you know, going from place to place, I mean, here, it's basically robbing them, but, you know, the, they don't necessarily kill all of them. But it's it's not a spoiler that, that they do kill. It's in like the first five minutes you see one of them killed. So yeah, it's a yeah. There's there's a there's there's a method to gradually working through these dangerous criminals and doing it very carefully. Very, I mean, these four prostitutes have far better far more detailed plans that really, you know, take things into account. And so, I mean, in, in Hitman Agent 47, a lot of the time he is kind of just having to, you know, figure out how to work around, you know, a lot of things happen that are not really under his control. But, yeah, these four, they have very detailed plans and and re really very clever ones except for the very last one that one's stupid the other critics have already pointed out that the you know there's there's a double standard to the sexual exploitation we are both supposed to cheer that the these you know human traffickers are getting taken down at the same time as we are fully expected to leer at their girls you know objectifying them just as much as the, you know not as you know yeah objectifying them not us the viewer directly you know actually engaging in sex without consent, but nevertheless, to to them and to us, every woman in this film is incredibly sexy and is sexualized at all times. And they do, they tend to sexualize themselves in just as, you know, I swear I'm not making this up. These former prostitutes who are trying desperately to get rid of this kingpin who is a human trafficker and you know it's it's clear that this is this is vengeance this is something that and yet again without going into details let's just say that there may be they may be appreciated what you know, either Frank maybe helps them with, and guess how they choose to show that gratitude? It's just, you know, when, when someone is struggling to get out of sex work, to escape from it, they don't tend to use Yeah, they, they tend to try to do do without it. And yeah, and and even and and just yeah, in general, the these women are always sexualized. Even you know, again, hypothetically, let's say someone is maybe in a dangerous situation, they're still you know, made up to look really sexy. It's I guess about as bad as Byzantium, but yeah, ab about the same. The various heads of the Russian Mafia, as seen here, 
have separate like headquarters, in, including a jet, a rave club, and a a yacht. I yeah, and of course that means that the prostitutes will have to get get to them safely in these settings and yeah like i said some some nice elaborate heists which just you know when when i think transport i think heists i i should mention as part of the sexualization it's not really made like hugely clear but it looks like two of the prostitutes anna and one of the others they they wear blonde wigs a lot so it's a little difficult to tell them all apart but anna and one of the others appear to be that you know they they say i love you i love you and how might they show that well yes they kiss on screen several times and again if this was just like you know just just sweet sure but no of course it's made sexual you know we're supposed to sit and gawk at these two former prostitutes who i, I mean i don't know if it's supposed to be that they've been turned off to sex with men from being forced into it again none of them seem to mind getting very close and sexual with frank and such but yeah again it's just it's there for us to gawk at they do kind of have like separate personalities some but one of them just comes off as kind of scaredy cat and a little annoying because every time something dangerous is happening she's like oh no what what now and just yeah one example of the sexualization of these excuse me these women an early scene has the these these high higher ups from the Russian mob checking out new girls apparently or something like that and they're basically like dancing grooving in front of all of them and throughout this entire scene you never see the face of a single one of these women all you see is the you know their their ass as as they're dancing you know so again the movie isn't exactly making a, a you know it's it's not it's not really taking a, the moral high ground over these you know yeah and in that scene they they do something absolute i i i know that today nobody has you know the people's attention spans are like nothing but this scene happens about 10 minutes into the movie and it reintroduce it it makes sure to show that all of the, the the very first scene of the film takes place in 95 and the rest of the movie takes place in 2010 no i don't know why either and in the 95 scene we see all these leaders of the and and i think and and there's this one prostitute who chooses to work more directly for them with them and when we when we get a flashback to her she does look a little different it might be two different actresses i'm not entirely sure but the rest are clearly the same people it's it's not like they recast these people they look exactly the same i mean okay maybe they aged 15 years i don't know but we see them and they look basically the same so it's like the movie thinks that we forgot what we saw 10 minutes ago it's pretty ridiculous and then here's the kicker one of them says 
we've been working together for 12 years, haven't we? And then another corrects 15. So just, just you know, film can be very difficult to... to <clears throat> Sometimes film just have all these layers to them, and it's difficult for us, the viewer, to, to comprehend everything. And sometimes it's very useful for the characters to just pause the movie and reiterate what we might have missed. So so just just in case you weren't sure that these two scenes that happen, you know, there's there's very little that happens in the movie between these two scenes. But just so you know, the people you see in 95 and the people you see in 2010, they are the same people. So just, you know, if you think you're crazy, just they are the same people. And they have been working together for the entire duration of time that 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 happened between the 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 date at at the start and the date then then given ten minutes in. I I hope I haven't lost you because and the. I really wish I was making this one up. The first time that the 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 prostitutes, the two of them, say to to one another, "One for all, and all for one." I was like, "Well, that was out of nowhere." Okay, someone someone likes that that book, and then they reference it again, and again, and again, and at no point does this add anything to the movie at all. I think the script writer happened to be reading some of that book while he was writing the script in like breaks from writing. He would read it and he'd be like, this is amazing. I have to put this in our movie, no matter how awkward it is. And it is very, very awkward. There's, there's that thing of never reference a great work in the middle of your crappy one. And though that is a book and this is a film, yeah, you, I haven't watched all of them. But if you happened, if, if you had like a dartboard of all the different movie adaptations of The Three Musketeers, and you just, at random, you pretty much guarantee you'll get a better movie than this one. And that does include the 2010, I think, one? Yes, the Paul W. S. Anderson one. And The Musketeer. Now... The movie, without counting the end credits, is 85 minutes long, so that comes to about two hours. And I know some people are saying it, you know, it's, it's more like two and a half, it's more like three hours. I wouldn't go quite that far, but I, I know 85, doesn't that add up to an hour and a half? Ah, you wish you'd get that kind of mileage out of this one. It feels far far longer than it is. The film is very stupid and thankfully it does know it, but you do really miss Jason Statham's you know, deadpan self-awareness which really made it much more enjoyable and yeah to, to me he'll always be the actual frank martin but even from just like interviews and stuff i you know find myself kind of liking this ed scrine guy i haven't i haven't watched game of thrones but i understand that he like quit that to do this dude fire agent and the you know he he learned martial arts for this You can tell a little, little bit that that he, you know, 
he learned it for this, whereas Jason Statham already knew. If he's he's okay, basically, but yeah, he's just he's not that interesting, and it's it's difficult to do. Again, I I give big props to. I can't believe I've forgotten his name. The the man who played forty seven in Hitman Agent forty seven because he nails it. It's very difficult to get write a kind of cold, detached character and still get across that there is some, you know, some moral fiber in there. And you know, to 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 get that across without the character seeming boring or you know, wooden and yeah, it he's he's just not quite up to it. And this not only no Jason Statham, we don't even have an inspector Tarconi. He was even in the t TV series, which I never watched. Now, as far as my previous experience with these, I really like the first two movies. I have not watched the third one yet, but I definitely will, because the villain is apparently played by Robert Knepper, who I love, you know, Prison Breaks Teabag, he is kind of the golem of that show, that, you know, just, you you can see how this guy might be a good guy, but there's just so much bad there, to still, you know, and, I mean, Robert Knepper gets, like, special points for me, just because his last name literally, in Danish, means screwing, like, Robert is screwing. That's that's if if you just read out his name in Danish. And yeah, that's that's yeah, that that is I that's a good name. No one gives him a good performance in this. Not a single person. I this is the first time Ray Stevenson he still got some charm. You really feel bad for the guy for having to work with this terrible dialogue. I mean, when it's not awkwardly expositioning or just being bland, the one-liners are some of the worst. Just terrible. The, the banter. Every action movie needs banter. The banter is terrible in this. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. And this, of course, I've already mentioned somewhat that, you know, it's this human trafficking thing. You know, this... Obviously, those who are human trafficked, it is very much against, you know, it's... They, they were usually tricked or, you know, forced they, you know, and they would do anything to get out of it. But this movie kind of makes it seem as though prostitutes in general, just like, you know, sex workers, just all of them, you know, this this idea that this is just always invariably a noble cause, such this outdated notion that all sex workers are just helplessly waiting for the knight in shining armor to come and save them from their plight. You know, because nobody could possibly choose sex work, enjoy sex work. You know, there's there's no no such thing. And also it's noteworthy that apparently these four prostitutes are like experts at technology and I mean these these heists that they're planning Again, I, I love that we have these empowered women, but it should make some kind of sense. You know, you have to actually explain why do these characters know and act the way that we see them know and act, because it just, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's absurd. And I know that saying something's absurd in this, 
like I said, the movie knows how stupid it is. And there are, to be fair, there are a few cool, dumb, fun ideas that, you know, you're, you're going to remember from this. But overall, it just, it lacks energy. It doesn't have enough fun ideas. And the ideas also just feel misplaced. You know, a, a transporter movie with very little driving and no real transporting. I... It's it's like making a Taken movie where no one's taken. The the women are clearly there for eye candy, but to be fair, they are also smart, strong, and very cunning. You know these, yeah, very good plans for these various actions and yeah I, I, I already covered that there is a there's an overuse of slow-mo it there's especially early on where it gets really ridiculous there the first time Frank takes a job in this is when he's just taking these three of the prostitutes you know he's asked to meet them at a bank and like first Anna comes in and sits and you know the and and Frank at this point doesn't know that the other two are also women he's just been told there are two packages come to 104 kilos and then when the other two women walk out of the bank, it's just epic slow-mo. And we have no idea that some excuse me, that something dramatic has happened at this point. I mean, a little bit later they say, so right after, you know, right before we see them leave the bank, they actually rob the bank. But we don't know that when we first just see them walking in slow motion. It's not clear that, you know, if you're going to do a flashback, put it there, you know, have the, the women walk out, brief slow-mo flashback to how they just robbed the, you know, just details of how they just robbed the bank and then move on, you know, so it means something to the audience instead of just pointless slow-mo that just, yeah. And, um... It's not entirely clear if this is a reboot or just a recasting. You know, it's it's clear that in 95 or before, so the, the transporter was already working. So it's not, you know, I mean, in spite of the fact that Scrine is, you know, as young as he is and... I mean, Statham's, he's not old by, by action movie standards. He is maybe getting on in years, although, you know, what with the Expendables, he's like the baby in that group. But, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's not like this transporter just started working, you know, just now. So, I... I don't know, or if like, I mean, I don't, I don't think that the, the, the father character is supposed to be the Statham character, but yeah, I, and, and as the movie starts, he is retiring and it's clear that he had some kind of job that was, you know, military something or other. He claims he sold Avian to, I think that's how you pronounce it, bottled water to, you know, various foreign countries. Now, it's, others have already pointed out this has something of a James Bond feel and it really doesn't fit. 
Yeah, that's very, very much so. And this is apparently supposed to start off a new trilogy, but <laughs> given the reception, I watched this on the very first day that it came, you know, tonight here in Denmark, or at least in, in my theater. Um, you know, I don't live in Copenhagen, so it's possible when it came out. There were two other people. Possibly, possibly four, actually, come to think of it. But that was it. So, yeah, it wasn't exactly something people were, you know, absolutely just, you know, clearing their schedule to catch. And this is apparently the second second film that the this director has done. And the first one was apparently decent. And, it's, you know, going by, like, you know, what little I could see on IMDb and such. And he has done other work for, you know, Luc Besson properties. Now... The, as, as someone else pointed out, the, the fight scenes are kind of posy and, you know, it doesn't really look like, look like the blows really connect, much less hurt. And it's also been pointed out that, you know, the fight scenes are very prop dependent, but that's really always been the case for the Transformers. Again, I can't speak for the third one, but definitely the first two. And, yeah, I mean, there's this one fight where, basically, Frank is between, like, you know, there's barely room for him between these two rows of filing cabinets. And there's a few guys in front of him, and there are several guys behind him. And... As he fights them, he'll like pull out a drawer and knock it into the face of someone, or pull out a drawer to block someone's path, pull out a, a drawer and then grab someone's leg and slam it down into the drawer and maybe slam the, the drawer back into, you know, that gets kind of creative. Again, you know, hence the problem I just mentioned, but it does get somewhat creative and that's, it's, it's okay, but it has nothing on the fight in the oil in the first one and the yeah the the second ones i can't quite recall like specifics i mean to remember the first one but yeah the the second one had some great stuff as well and yeah this one just doesn't also i mean the second one has that awesome, you know, woman, you know, like, like, she's like the right hand of the bad guy, and she's got, like, dual-wielding submachine guns, you know, you, you, you remember her, and every time she and Frank face off, it's awesome, you know, and there's no character like that in this, and it's also, I mean, the four prostitutes, Anna gets time and a personality, screen time, but the others, it's, there's not that much to distinguish them from each other, and yeah, just, there's not much there. And the, Now, the, the fighting is apparently a mix of Krav Maga and Filipino martial arts. And I already mentioned that there's not a lot of driving. There's, there's, there's a chase through a tunnel, which is okay. And there is this... You know, you've, you've, seen, you've seen the trailer, this bit where they, like you know, it, it drives up a, one of those ramp things and, you know, flies through the air and 
lands and keeps driving in the what, what's it called you know the thing you walk through when you're boarding the plane that you know the plane then moves you know they they pull it back and the you know plane takes off from that you know whatever yeah that you know also part of a chase and it's just come to think of it Taken 3 also had a lackluster chase near like an airport and such these people just need to put on a face off and look at the master deal with a proper car chase scene on the on the what's it called, runway of an airport that that is how you do it now the various shootouts and you know fights and such there are more fights than or yeah I, I think overall there's at least you know the the driving we definitely were left you know really wondering if this actually is a transporter movie the other kinds of action there's a decent amount of the there's there's a yeah there's a pretty good amount of the martial arts fight scenes just again they're mostly kind of bleh others have pointed out that the action is this choppy fast cut and too close up it's just I I could more or less follow what was going on I would say and there is a pretty good amount of action there's there's a lot of action but it's just not you know a lot of it is just not all that engaging and the you know, and the various, excuse me, stunts and such get really, you know, dumb and over the top. And another reviewer pointed out that the car chases are more about the loud crashes and CGI than the thrill of the speed, and that's very, very true. That that was especially something I noted in the in the chase scene in the tunnel. It just really again just watch the born supremacy to see a mighty fine tunnel chase scene, you know, and and just this. I mean, actually, that was that was some. Some of the the chases, especially when when there were crashes, there were times where I was having trouble keeping up with who was where, and yeah, this has been called crass nonsense, which I think is quite succinct. And And someone pointed out that this feels like a long Audi ad. I, I would again say it's not all an Audi ad. It's like with Hitman Agent 47. It's really only when the when they're doing driving, and that's not all that much. But but yeah, during those scenes, and someone else has already also already pointed out that the Somehow, Frank's car never gets a dent. Nothing. It's just, it's preposterous. And it's not like part of the fun of the car chase is to see even the good guy's car get smashed up. That's just, watch Blues Brothers. Watch that final epic car chase. And the, yeah, that it feels like just an, an Audi ad 
with the look of a Vanity Fair spread, you know, all poses and pouts. And yes, that, that quite, and, and where by comparison, the previous films are very much this low down dirty, you know, hands on, you know, bare knuckle fighting kind of thing. And yeah, you can you can really tell it's a huge tonal shift and not one that was at all necessary or one that will at all be well received in addition to what has already been received. The samurai-like code of Frank, it's actually, it's, it's given lip service at the very start, but then it's basically just dropped for the rest of the film. And I mean, they do at least, like, there's a reason why he drops it, but again, that's a big part of what we love about the transporter, is the, yeah. And you can also really tell that they cut the budget tremendously and it is you know nicely filmed and edited and such but you know that doesn't that doesn't do much for the terrible material and it has you know others have noted it has a European feel to it and that it's basically just it it fits in every, you know, every major action cliche that you'd expect. And it's nothing we haven't seen before. And again, just briefly on Hitman Agent 47, I, I would watch Hitman Agent 47 a thousand times more before I rewatch this once. This is nothing you need to spend any money on. If at some point you want to watch at least parts of, you know, if if like a friend of yours gets a copy in a few years, borrow it from, fast forward through the parts that don't really have, if, well, yeah, you, you know, fast forward through anything that doesn't have the driving and just get some of that because that, that actually, yeah, if I had to, some of some of the driving stuff actually is again it has nothing on the other but at least it doesn't rely on human actors who clearly the the fighting this is not convincing and the the cars it actually does look like stuff is actually happening and beyond that, just, yeah, you, you really don't need to spend any time on this. And, you know, no, more, no matter how much you love the series, no matter how much... I mean, I guess if, you, if you're really into Ed Scrine or something, but other than that, just, yeah, nothing to see here. Please comment, thumbs up, and subscribe for more content.